Uh, guys, please respond to the poll, please. So this is a word cloud, so you can use a word or a phrase, and there's no right answer, there's no wrong answer. This is just your thinking as we begin this session today. What word or phrase for you and your view and your personal view sums up the state of, of journalism today? What word or phrase? Okay, now I see 10 responses, that's great. I'll show you on the screen just a moment what you and your colleagues are saying. And then we will dive in momentarily. So. Okay, let's take a look at what people are saying. Okay, continue. You can feel free to continue responding. I see now there are 18 responses, so continue uh, responding. Um, and adding your own view. Uh, but so far we hear people saying abysmal, sad, disturbing, um, fake propaganda, aiding genocide. So a lot of negative terms. We do see a few positive terms. Um, technology can save journalism, exciting. Um, we also see corporatism, homogeneous, under attack, biased, bought. Um, we see entertainment. Um, so a lot of a lot of negative terms, I would say, a lot of a lot of concern and um, and a lot of uh, I see chaos, inflexible, sycophancy, unpredictable, polarized. I, I also see vibrant um, and sad and committed. Uh, TRP. I'm not sure what that refers to exactly. Um, pretentious. Um, so lots of lots of different views, and 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 you know, for each of us, there's probably some uh, variety of different thoughts that we have about about um, about this. Um, I'm going to close this poll and move on to uh, to one other opening one, um, and I want to ask you uh, a, a simpler question, maybe. And there obviously are many possible options here, but, but I've just chosen a few. What, what, are, what do you see as, as the biggest challenge um, facing journalism? Is it a business a set of business challenges? Is it declining trust? Is it censorship? Is it alternatives and technology challenges, intermediaries, social media platforms, or, or something else that's not listed here? So I'll give you a minute to, uh, to uh, put in your thoughts on that, and then I'll show you the results. And I appreciate your participation in the in these uh, in these polls. Um, this is what helps us make a, a session that could be a one way talk into a, a multi party conversation, which is what I hope we can do today. Okay, I see twenty five responses, and let's see what the what the uh, group feels. See if you can guess what your colleagues are likely to to think. And, and now we have 34 responses. Um, give you a few more seconds to respond. Now we're up to 40 responses, 42, that's great. Okay, so we're, we're approaching the halfway mark. If we can get half the people participating, that's a great, a, great, uh, a great thing. So we're up to 47, 48. And let's look at what people are saying. Okay, censorship, interestingly, is the number one challenge, according to this group. 38% um, uh, say that of the 51 who have responded, 39% now. And uh, declining trust, 31%. Business challenges, 21%. Social media platforms, alternatives uh, to news, just 6% um, cited that as the, the biggest challenge. So 
so that's that's also interesting, and this is also um, you know something that varies group to group and maybe even month to month. Uh, we face so many different kinds of challenges in the in the world of journalism. And uh, what I want to share with you is is today is some of what I see as the way forward uh, for the journalism ecosystem and, and some of what's happening around the world in the in the realm of entrepreneurial journalism. Um, so thank you for participating in those polls. Um, I'm happy to dive in, but I, I want to just make sure our hosts, uh, if you have any comments before I dive right in, um, feel free to to share those, um, and then I will I will switch gears and, and jump into my slides. Okay, I'm going to dive right in then. Um, Dev and others, feel free to jump in if you want to interrupt. Um, I encourage you also on the on the uh, Slido, you'll see that there is a Q and A tab. So if where you were asked, where you were looking at the polls, you'll see if you look at your screen, there's a little tab that says Q and A. And if you'd like to, um, you can feel free to pose an anonymous question there. Um, if you'd like, and I will about halfway through, and then again at the end, I will take a look at those questions and try to answer them to the best of my ability. Um, you can also, um, at any point, feel free to drop a question in the chat, and I will try to take a look at that as well. Um, and and uh, the hosts here can help uh, uh, unmute and, and let me know if there are questions uh, during the question period, um, halfway through and then again at the end. Okay, so feel free to, to share your thoughts. You can also share your opinions, your comments, anything you'd like in, in the chat. Um, I, I'd be happy to hear your thoughts along the way, and, and you should feel free to share thoughts for, for one another. Okay, um, and let's let's dive in. And, and I will have a couple of other poll questions along the way, so hopefully you'll participate in, in those as well. And now I'm gonna shift gears into the, the, uh, the, the slides. So uh, welcome again, I'm Jeremy Kaplan. I teach at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. And I'm uh, really honored to be with you today. This is a real special privilege for me to, to, uh, to be joining you. Uh, there are three things to know about me. Number one is the most important thing to me is my family. I have a uh, wife and two daughters are, are, are shown here. I, have, I come from a family of six children, uh, five siblings. I'm from Boston. Um, these are my daughters, uh, Rebecca and Charlotte, who are nine and six, and my wife, Karen. We live in New York City and Manhattan. And uh, I am a journalist by background. The middle column there are some of the things that I've worked on over the years, mostly at Time Magazine, writing about business and technology and international affairs and all sorts of things that, that we did at a general interest magazine. Each week was a little bit different. And I'm sure many of you have had a similar experience in, in journalism. And now I focus on teaching. And this is my passion is, is learning and teaching. And those two things go together. And I, I'm really um, uh, very passionate about the, the work that I do to, to help the next generation of journalists develop their skills and, and knowledge. And I've uh, now taken to running a new program called the Journalism Creators Program. And this is for journalists, independent journalists around the world who want to launch new ventures, new newsletters, podcasts, niche websites, local sites, all kinds of communities around the world. And, we are approaching uh, almost 100 people who have been in this program since, since we began the new version online um, a couple of years ago in 2020. Um, and it's uh, 100 days fully online. So we have people from all over the world. In fact, in our upcoming cohort, which is beginning next week, uh, the journey will include people from 15 different countries, which is really exciting to me. We, we all learn from each other. And I also, on the side, write a, write a newsletter of my own. I started uh, during the pandemic as a pandemic side project something called Wonder Tools. And um, I'll put the, the link in the chat so you can see uh, kind of another hat that I wear. Um, and this is, it's wondertools.substack.com. I just put it in the chat. And basically this is where I help people make more effective use of their time, uh, particularly for journalists and others who use uh, different kinds of tools for storytelling. And uh, each week I focus on a different useful tool to help you work more productively and be creative with the work that you do in journalism and it's free. And I hope some of you might find it useful. So a few topics that I wanna focus on today and, uh, and then at the end, and as I said, halfway through, we'll take some time for, for questions as well. And if at any point you can't hear me or see me, please let me know in some way um, because that will be helpful. I'm assuming 
that you can see the slides and you can hear me okay, right? Maybe I can get a, a little confirmation in the chat um, just so I know that you're hearing me and seeing me okay and you're seeing the slides okay. Um, you can just mark that in the chat or give me a thumbs up. Great, thank you. I see that in the chat, thank you. Um, so in, on, on the agenda, um, we're gonna start with this uh, poking a hole in this myth of innovation. So there's a, a very common myth uh, in, in the journalism world that uh, technology will save us. And I'm gonna poke a hole in that, um, or at least in, from my perspective. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some directions I think we're gonna move in, in the journalism ecosystem uh, post pandemic. I will briefly share some thoughts I have about this new journalism era and some of the challenges we're facing coming into that. And, and many of you pointed out some of those challenges in the polls that we began with. Uh, I will also uh, walk through a brief, very brief case study of the New York Times. And it's, it's an organization that's right next to us here at the school in New York City where I'm, where I'm standing today. And um, I'm just gonna share a little bit of what I think is interesting about that organization, which is a very traditional organization that was in deep trouble not too long ago and has turned around the ship and is now doing some very creative things. And I wanna share with you a couple of thoughts about that. And then uh, for the, the bulk of the rest of the time, we'll focus on journalism creators. So independent journalists, innovative journalists. And, and I wanna share a message with you, which is a call to action, which is that I think each one of us should have a side project. We each should have our own independent venture, whether we do it for money, for love, for fun, for learning, those are all good reasons to do it. Uh, but I think we each have a, uh, an opportunity and in a way a responsibility to ourselves to, to, to create something of our own. And uh, toward the end of the, the session, I will share uh, a, a brief, a few thoughts and some resources on that. So that's where we're headed. Um, and again, I wanna encourage you along the way to, to jump in with questions in the chat. Um, I will try to pick them up when I see them and I will also make a point of stopping uh, about halfway through and, and, um, and trying to address them. Okay, so innovation hype. Uh, this is the first point I wanna make about the, the technology point. And the idea here is that for many, many years, um, really uh, since the history of, of journalism, right? We've, we've relied on technology in various different ways, right? Whether to print newspapers or magazines, whether to distribute television programs or radio, uh, and certainly in the internet era, we've relied upon technology. So technology of one sort or another. So technology does lie at the, at the foundation of the distribution of news and information to a great extent. However, in recent years, we have focused on this idea of technology as savior, right? That somehow one of these technologies is going to be the silver bullet that's really gonna transform the journalism ecosystem and transform the economics of journalism. That was really the promise, for example, of the iPad back in 2012. Steve Jobs, the, the, the uh, then CEO of, of Apple, stood on stage, welcomed uh, journalists. They sat on a couch. They talked about how the iPad was going to transform journalism and consumption of, of news forever. And there was a whole iPad store for, for news and for, for reading magazines and newspapers online. And uh, many news organizations created new divisions focused on transforming their content for the iPad. Now, I don't make the claim that the iPad is useless or that it's, 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 it's not a, a, a great technology. It's, it's, it's really wonderful. If you've any, ever used a tablet, it's a nice thing. And it's been useful as a way for, for reading. Uh, and, and a lot of people find it a, a very useful device. So, and, and the same with many of these technologies. It's not that they're bad technologies or that they're necessarily harmful or, or that they're not useful in some way. My claim is instead that they're not the savior. These are not the, the key factors of innovation that are actually gonna be transformative for journalism. So I think that the first point is really that we wanna move beyond this focus, this exclusive focus on technology as the, the kind of potential savior and instead focus on, on what I like to call incremental innovation, which means innovation in how we tell stories and who we actually tell the stories for, how we do our journalism, how we comprise the teams that we um, that we run our organizations with, how we uh, become more inclusive of the people we are representing in the news, um, and, and, and how we think about both the community engagement 
the participation of the community that we're reaching out to, whether we're producing content for, for newspapers or magazines or TV or radio or, or digital or whatever sort, um, and, and how, we, how we monetize that, how we think about the business side. Those require incremental innovations. Those require creative, progressive, thoughtful steps. They don't require some kind of dramatic lightning from the heavens in the form of, of technology. I won't walk through all of these examples of technology. I think many of them will be familiar to, to many of you. I'll just give one other example, uh, virtual reality, VR, um, the New York Times, which I'll get, tell you more about later. They actually sent hundreds of thousands of these cardboard, these kind of cardboard VR readers to, uh, to their readers in order to help readers read their, uh, sorry, view their virtual reality stories. Uh, a few years ago, they spent a quite a huge amount of money on that and invested a whole uh, team's efforts uh, for more than a year in producing daily VR stories, for example. And yet, and yet, at this point, the VR is really not at all a part of their strategy any longer. And, and again, it's not because the technology isn't useful or that people might not enjoy it in some respect. It's just it's not meaningful in, in a grand scale for the business that they're in. The latest of these technologies, including DAOs, which are distributed organizations, Web3 technologies, um, NFTs, these are new kinds of technologies you may be reading about and hearing about and thinking about. I think they're interesting, but again, I do not think they will be tra transformative, just as blockchain uh, failed to be a transformative technology when it was heralded as a big new direction for journalism a few years ago. Okay, so what about post-pandemic journalism? How is journalism changing? Um, now, there obviously are changes all over the world, and, and every place uh, has, has its cultural specificity, but I think there are a few directions in journalism that are international or will be international if they aren't already. And, and, and one of them is this notion of new kinds of frameworks for thinking about journalism. And in our time today, we don't have full time to explore all of these in full. So I just want to highlight a couple of, of them. The first is solutions journalism. And many of you may be familiar with that. And, and it's, it's a, a, I think, a really interesting movement that focuses on taking a different perspective on what journalism can do. And it says that it's not sufficient to dump problems onto the lap of readers and viewers and listeners and to say, this is something that happened yesterday. This is something that happened yesterday. This is something that happened yesterday over and over and over again. Instead, what we need to do is be part of a dialogue as to how are we going to address the various problems that we encounter. Now, it's not advocacy journalism. I wanna be clear about that. Solutions journalism doesn't mean advocating a particular solution or particular political party or any of that. What it is, is a hard-headed analytical look at how are these problems coming about? What are the sources of these problems? What are some potential solutions people are talking about or considering? What are some of the pros and cons of some of those different approaches? Who are the players and what are their incentives? What are their, their um, motivations? What are their potential conflicts of interest? And so on and so forth. What are solutions and efforts that have been tried in other cities or in other countries? It's, it's a hard-headed analytical approach to looking at problems at their roots and looking at potential solutions and pointing forward and adding to the dialogue and conversation. And one of the reasons that's so essential is not only because of the question of trust, and the question of people's dismissal of traditional journalism in many cases, but because we need journalists to play a role in some of the big problems that we're facing in today's societies. The second area here, uh, dialogue journalism has to do with essentially convening conversations and getting people to address that polarization issue that some of you mentioned in that opening poll. Engagement journalism says that we don't just have people participate in the bottom at the, in the uh, kind of comments ghetto below story, right? We actually engage them throughout the process of reporting. We ask people open-ended questions. What are the challenges you're facing in your community? What are the issues you face? What keeps you up at night if you're one of our readers or our viewers or our listeners, right? It's not just about give me a quote. What do you think? And I'll put in a sentence in my article or my TV report or my radio report about this, right? That's the way too many journalists have done their work in the past, looking for an individual quote to drop into a story that they've already written, right? Instead, we need to take a more open-minded open approach, a bottom-up approach, really getting to know our communities, really getting to know people's lives, really getting to appreciate what are the things that matter to them on a day-to-day -day basis, 
and helping them to drive what we actually look into and, and report on, not just assuming that we in an ivory tower know what's most important and imposing that upon people. And that's a very different way of approaching and thinking about journalism. Um, that's, a, that's an engagement journalism kind of mindset. Um, public powered journalism also includes people in that dialogue as does Renaissance and constructive journalism. I wanna give you a specific example to make this maybe a little bit more concrete. Here's a project called The Listening Post. This is a project out of New Orleans, a relatively poor part of New Orleans in the United States. And what they did was a simple thing. They, they were coming in to report. And rather than just saying, here are the five things we're going to report on, they basically said, what, what, what's, what's challenging for you? What's missing in this city for you? Text us. Send us a text message, right? And it turned out that a lot of people were very concerned about the cost of, of, of real estate and housing. They were spending 60%, 70%, 50% of their income on real estate, on housing, and it was decrepit. It was falling apart. Um, the landlords weren't respecting their, their, their conditions of their housing and so forth. And what they did was they then asked people, you know, how can we be helpful with this? And, they, and the people wanted to know who owns some of these buildings, right? What are the laws that are regulating them? Are they following the laws, right? What can be done about this? Um, and they wanted to know you know, was anybody going to look into this? Was anybody, anybody going to report on this? And they did. And that was what they, 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 they reported on that. And it was a, a, it was a project that was really quite, quite impactful. Um, and that's an example of engagement journalism. That's, that's an example of solutions journalism. That's, that's uh, community engagement in action and, and quality journalism. It's not the only form of quality journalism, of course. There's a lot of other kinds of journalism that are essential investigative and accountability journalism are at the core of what we do, for example. Um, dialogue journalism is another part, uh, another uh, framework that I mentioned, and uh, an example of that in Germany is called My Country Talks, and they essentially brought people together in the real world to have conversations about complex and polarizing issues. There's another organization in the U.S. called Spaceship Media, and uh, Spaceship Media does a similar thing, bringing people together across the political divide in small groups and in sometimes larger groups and discussing those polarizing issues and evolving past the superficial um, kind of talking points into more in-depth coverage of those issues. And I would argue we're in this third era now. And, and when we look at the journalism ecosystem and where things are today, we started just moving things online, right? That early era, some of you will remember, you know, the first time uh, news was online, right? It was just a flat representation of what was already in print form, for example. Then we moved into the mobile and social era, right? 2007, I remember well, the week I was married. Uh, 2007, July 1st, the iPhone came out. And the iPhone was transformative because it provided a whole new means of distribution and consumption and creation, right? It was a triple header. And obviously the iPhone was just the beginning of that whole era. The social era uh, followed there, thereafter with the rise of social media and social networks and what some people call web two, right? So web one was that first era, just putting information online that people could read or see. Web two was this interactive era, right? Not only could you just see information, you could generate content, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, right? Um, you could also share P2P, person to person through WhatsApp and other kinds of platforms like that, right? So that was web two. Web three, which is coming now, right? Which is at least being explored now, right? Is this idea that we move beyond control by the largest platforms like Facebook, like uh, Google and YouTube and, and other major organizations, TikTok, um, et cetera. And we move more towards collaborative, right? Open source technologies, uh, web three technologies, right? Other kinds of ways of governing the, the internet. Um, that's at least the, the promise of web three. We'll see how things play out. Um, but, but from a journalism perspective, what's really most relevant is that this is the era of focusing on sustainability. So in the US, in the United States alone, just as one example, one data point, we've lost 2,100 newspapers over the past 15 years. That's 2,100 newspapers have closed over the past 15 years. And uh, many others have shrunk. And so when we talk about sustainability in this era, we really mean how do we find the appropriate business models that will make quality journalism sustainable? And so that's really what we're in. That's the era we're in. And, and I'll say some more about that as we go, including in this New York Times case study in just a moment. Uh, now, I want to be clear, we face a lot of challenges, right? So this is not a, a simple 
uh, set of solutions. This is not a simple transformation. This is this is a, a really a multifaceted set of problems. And and you all pointed out censorship. I'm not even going to focus on censorship today uh, because that there's a whole set of issues around that um, that are more complicated than we have time for in this in this short session. But I, I just want to mention a few of the big challenges: uh, disappearing ad revenue, declining trust, evolving technology, um, news deserts, like large swaths of areas around the world that have no access to quality news. Um, uh, censorship, as, as you all mentioned, um, and then uh, violence against journalists. Um, this era has been a particularly violent one and dangerous one for journalists, not only in conflict zones, but in zones where there are powerful gangs and others who don't want independent reporting to, to threaten their, their livelihood uh, in the drug trade, for example. Now, if you look at India, and, and just to pick out a couple of these uh, data points, if you look at India, this is according to the Reuters Digital News Report, just 36 percent of people in India say they trust the news overall. Uh, and, and again, we can parse this and it obviously varies region to region and it depends how people are defining news and so forth. So there's a lot of caveats here, but the Reuters Digital News Report has uh, done this kind of survey work around the world. And in India, the, the, the level of trust falls uh, below the average uh, globally. Um, so, so clearly this is one of the issues faced in India, but obviously not just in India, right? And, and here's an example of the European data. So European data overall Euro across Europe, 47% um, say they trust the written press specifically, and 47% and say they do not. Um, and in, in, and uh, in the US, this question was asked recently during the pandemic about who people trusted, what kinds of sources. And you can see I highlighted where journalists fall at the bottom of this, of, of this group. Right? They trust healthcare CEOs, they trust doctors and scientists and many others, coworkers. They even trust their country's leader more than they trust journalists, um, at least in, in this, in this um, Edelman. This is a 2020 Edelman trust uh, survey. So we clearly have a challenge that we face to restore the trust of people. Um, we also have this business challenge. So I mentioned um, that earlier and, and the role of the platforms. And this is just, again, a single data point just to illustrate that uh, we face a real big challenge from an economic perspective, right? As you all know. So just to make it simple, two thirds out of every digital ad dollar, right? That comes in uh, to, the, to the digital ad economy goes to one of these three companies, right? In the US, um, Facebook, Amazon, and, and Google. And this is largely true to, to differing extents in Europe and Latin America and Asia and elsewhere in the world. And um, the 38% that remain doesn't just go to the news organizations, right? It gets sliced up into these tiny little pieces, right? Distributed to all of the different players online. So, so that is a really big challenge facing, facing news organizations, which are also at the same time as they're facing declining ad revenue, facing in many cases, declining subscription revenue, at least traditional print subscription revenue. Although in some cases they're gaining uh, marginally more digital, uh, digital subscription revenue. And one of the threats that we face is not from other uh, news or other journalism, right? When, when people under 45 were asked in a variety of countries, um, including the ones you see here listed, France, Italy, Spain, Norway, Sweden, but also Austria, Japan, Australia, Canada, lots of places around the world, they were asked essentially, you know, if you could only, you know, have one subscription, would it be um, you know, what would you, what would you pick? Would it be something related to video or music or would it be news? And you can imagine it's probably not too surprising that people said they would keep their, their video subscription or their music, Spotify or Netflix or one of those. And, and very few said they would keep news. So we're competing against other kinds of subscriptions when it comes to subscription revenue. And the, the numbers around the world are, are modest in terms of the number of people willing to pay, right? This is just a sampling of, of Europe as an example, um, because you get a lot of data points right in Europe. Um, and, and there are some bright spots, right? If you look at Norway and Sweden, 42% um, of people are, are paying for online news uh, in, in Norway, 27% in Sweden, Denmark. I just spoke with a group of Danish journalists uh, yesterday, and uh, that, that number is rising in, in Denmark. Um, in the Southern parts, it's a little bit lower. Um, but in general, it is marginally moving slightly upward. People are more and more willing to open their pockets for, 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 to pay for news that they find relevant to them, right? That they find to be uh, a, of, of quality. Um, and you can see some of the data uh, from other countries. I, I didn't find a reliable data point for 
for India here. I think I think the the data that I saw was I was a little skeptical of. So I, I'd be curious if you all have have a, a number that you feel is reliable on this front. Um, but this is from the Reuters Digital News report, um, and just gives you a peek at sort of the willingness of people to pay for news around the world, at least at this point. And this is data as of as of 2020. Uh, by the way, I'm happy to share these stats, uh, the, these slides uh, with you that I show. So if, if there's something of interest, you can refer back to it later. Uh, so, so the money is a big challenge, right? The money we had and we expected to have um, as news organizations in many cases doesn't quite flow in the same way that, that it once did. However, I am actually an optimist. So I am someone who sees a lot of news organizations turning things around. And one of the things they're doing is moving from a world of dominated by two revenue streams, right? Which means advertising and subscriptions. Those are the two most, most kind of common historical revenue streams. And they're moving to a, a world where we have dozens of revenue streams, right? A portfolio of revenue streams. So that's the new approach, right? Just like in investing. I'm sure many of you have had occasion to invest uh, in one way or another, and you probably don't have one stock, right? Or one holding. You don't hold all your money in one particular way. Right? You probably have some diversification in some, some way, shape, or form. Right? And that means uh, the same thing in, in terms of revenue categories. Organizations need to have multiple different kinds of revenue streams. And I'll give you two examples as we go along, um, one of the New York Times and one of a small news organization and how they diversify their, their revenue streams. Um, but these are all uh, distinct revenue streams that have promise. Um, and if we have time, um, I'm happy to go through a, a little bit more about them individually. Um, I'm going to pause in a moment for, for some questions. Um, so feel free to drop those in the chat and I will look at the Q&A tab as well on, uh, on Slido in, in just a moment. Um, I just want to identify one other issue we have, um, which is the news deserts. Um, and, and this is a problem where we're in a growing place, the number of places in the US, but also uh, throughout Latin America, throughout the world, uh, we have empty spaces and we call them news deserts. And I'd be curious uh, about your, your view on, on the extent to which this is a problem in, in India. Um, but I think it's increasingly a problem in many parts of the world uh, that, where there's just no quality local news. And so what sometimes that means is people turn, turn to propaganda outlets like Fox News, for example, or the equivalent in, in other countries. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned, you know, we've, we've lost just a tremendous number of, of newspapers. So these are some of the challenges that, that we face. Um, in the U.S., uh, this is just a point about how, and this is true also in, 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 in uh, to some extent, Latin America, part of the problem is it's, it's a commercial industry, right? So we're faced with uh, hedge funds and, and private equity firms that essentially are buying up news organizations, selling the real estate, firing the journalists, and trying to squeeze out a little profit before shutting down the, uh, the newspapers in particular. So that's a big, a big challenge in, in the U.S. Um, at the moment. Now I have a question for for you all, and then I'll turn to uh, I'll turn to uh, some of your um, some of your uh, questions here. And what I want to uh, ask you is is what do you think about whether uh, the, where the funding should come from? So uh, should should journalism be a public good? In other words, do we all have access to quality journalism information in the same way we should have access to clean air and clean water and roads that are safe for us to, to drive or walk on? Or is journalism a commercial good? Should it be governed and, and operated purely through the free market so that we don't have the influence of censorious uh, government institutions, for example? Okay, that's the, the question I'm, I'm posing here. And, uh, and I'd be curious as to what you think about that. And then I'll, and then I'll turn to some questions. And then once we're uh, past that, I'll, I'll shift gears and, and give you a, a little case study of the New York Times and talk about some individual journalism creators. Okay, so that's where we're headed going forward. Okay, so I wanna encourage you to, to respond to this poll and then, um, and then uh, I'll dive into the, uh, the questions. Okay, I'm seeing some initial responses. And uh, and I will also um, take a look at the uh, questions now. You can continue responding to that 
to that poll and sharing your thoughts. Okay, let me look at these these questions and take a couple and feel free to add questions in the chat as well. Um, and I'll try to save a minute at the end. Uh, maybe I'll stick around a few more minutes at the end and, and take some additional questions after we, we conclude. Uh, how to engage in integrity-based journalism in an environment that's increasingly hostile to integrity with censorship and shrinking room for people-based reporting. Okay, so this is a big challenge, right? When you're facing strong censors that are hostile or, 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 or companies or anyone that's hostile, um, you're really in a difficult position. So there's no simple solution, right? Or you would have come up with it already. So I won't claim that I have a simple or magical answer. What I will say that is that we never, we have never had as much power as we have now to publish and distribute content independently, free of um, free of control, right? And and I, and I recognize that in different areas there are all kinds of different regulations and constraints and restrictions and threats. So so I don't say that lightly. Um, but I've seen journalists around the world, including in Venezuela, including in Cameroon and other parts of the world, where they face grave threats from government institutions and private thugs, I've seen journalists and I've uh, taught them uh, and I've seen them grow their own projects and distribute their information in all kinds of creative ways. So the, 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 the short answer that I'll give here is that I think it's important to have uh, to be creative about how we distribute information. And if the channels that are most immediately available to us, the public channels through newspapers and news organizations that we're part of, et cetera, are, are limited, we, uh, I think, can be creative about how we're distributing things in new and inventive ways. Um, in the case of the Venezuela journalist, um, she started something called Efecto Cucuyo. And she was actually the first woman to be a, a editor in chief of Venezuelan newspaper. And uh, she was ended up being on the time, um, uh, one of the time uh, people of the year a couple of years ago because of her work in, in, in Venezuela. Um, and, and one of the things that she did was use uh, social uh, platforms to, to kind of circumvent government censorship. I'm making a long story very short, uh, but she used WhatsApp and, and various other kinds of, of platforms to essentially gather information about voting uh, irregularities, distribute information freely, free of the censorship of the Venezuelan government and so on and so forth. Second question, uh, um, it's funny how we say technology will save us from the downfall of journalism started with the rise of tech induced social media platforms and alternative news. So I, I, I agree with the sentiment there, although I would say we have to be careful when we look at the data, the decline in, in journalism's perception, perceptions of journalism actually predates, if you look at some of the data, it actually predates the rise of the social platforms. So there were already some warning signs about the ad markets and about the uh, role of tr uh, the, the extent of trust in, in media before, before Facebook kind of dominated and, and, and Twitter and so forth. So, so there were some warning signs that, that suggest that maybe it's not just about the social platforms and it's not just about the role of technology. On the third question here, um, what are some business models that can, can be used to, in an engaging market like India? Yeah, so, so this is a big question and uh, I'm, I'm gonna try to get to that a little bit when we talk about the creators. Um, people's unw un unwillingness to pay for news and consumption is, is something you're pointing out here and, and I recognize and, and we've had many participants in our programs from, from different parts of India and, and also other parts of South, South, South Asia. And so I, I will again say there's no simple magic solution. I, I would be a fool to claim that there is one simple way to, 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 to address this big challenge. What I would say is that ultimately we're all human and what we need to do as business people, right? Is not just to be journalists, but to be business people. And what business people do is they think about the motivations behavioral economics, behavioral psychology. They think about what motivates people to pay, what people do pay for. Because if you look at a market like India, there's a great book called The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, which talks about countries where there's a different kind of, there's different kinds of distribution of wealth, right? And where you don't necessarily have willingness to pay in traditional ways. And one of the ideas there is that you, you, you look at different motivations of people to pay, different kinds of things people pay for, different things motivating people to pay, and that leads to a whole new approach to the kinds of products, the kinds of services, the kinds of pricing. And uh, it, it creates a whole new conversation about how you can do things. Um, and again, we, we will need more time to get into that in more depth, but that's an initial a thought on that. Um, how plausible is state funding akin to the way Deutsche Welle receives funding? Does this require trust building between the state and people? Yes, so state funding, I think, has great potential and also great danger. Uh, obviously, we've seen places where the government uh, controls the press. We see that in Russia today, right? The Russia, Russian government has essentially completely squashed any notion of a free press, and that's caused great damage to the people in Russia. 
not to mention, of course, the tragic situation for the millions of people in, in Ukraine, of course. Um, and so state funding can be uh, significantly uh, dangerous and problematic. Uh, however, state funding is not the only direction we can go in when we think about new uh, approaches to, to funding and, and, and thinking of journalism as a public good. Uh, philanthro uh, philanthropic funding is a big part of what's happening in the United States, where people who have lots of money are essentially saying, you know, instead of just supporting an environmental charity, we can su support environmental news organizations that are reporting on the raping and pillaging of the environment by corporations, and thereby do more good for the environment potentially than by just supporting an environmental charity. So philanthropic parties and entities can play a big role. I think universities can play a big role around the world in supporting quality journalism in an independent way. Uh, so I think there are multiple approaches there. Um, and I'm going to move onward um, because there's so much else that I want to get to. Um, but thank you for these questions and, and feel free to continue um, uh, uh, sharing them. And I'm going to just share a couple of the responses people uh, posed to the question about public funding. Similar to the Scandinavian countries, yes, I think that's an excellent approach. Uh, free markets, some people say, it should be independent. Um, it needs to be free and unbiased. Um, someone else says public funding will lead to a monopoly of one or two organizations. Um, government support will invite censorship and philanthropy is temporary. Okay, so there are lots of different views on this and, and um, it would require a, a much lengthier discussion to go through these viewpoints in, in full. But I just wanna get this question rumbling around because I think it's a really important one for us to consider as, as we move forward in this new era in, in, in journalism. And I think it's clear that we don't want a, a fully, completely, well, I, for me at least, we don't want a black or white solution entirely, right? We don't want full government control, absolutely. And I think we also don't want to, probably at least in my view, leave everything completely to the free market. Um, and uh, we can say more about that at the end if, if, if you'd like, but, um, but I, I wanna leave it there. Um, for now. Um, okay, so I want to jump into the, the, the New York Times uh, case study. So first of all, the New York Times publisher not too long ago, uh, Mark Thompson said that the New York Times would no longer be in print in 20 years, right? Uh, and a ways before that, the New York Times had been in such dire straits that they had to resort to a, a huge loan from someone named Carlos Slim. Does anyone know who Carlos Slim is? Is anyone familiar with that name? It's a Mexican billionaire who essentially loaned the New York Times some money so they could keep going, right? That's how desperate they were at one point. Um, this was a while back. Um, I don't remember the exact timing of that, but it was, uh, it was quite a while back. And they were, they were struggling for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one is that people were no longer as reliant on reading newspapers as they used to be, right? Very simple, very not surprising, right? Um, but there were many other reasons, many other challenges. And yet, the New York Times said, we are not going to die quietly, right? We're not going to go into the dustbin of history. Um, we're not going to be one of those uh, thousands of newspapers that have closed. We are going to try to fight, 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 and be innovative and be entrepreneurial. They actually physically switched their offices. They had these giant offices for editors. And one of the units they created was called Beta. It was basically a startup lab. And they switched the offices. So the people sat in little cubicles and the offices became these kind of think rooms, brainstorming rooms, collaboration rooms, startup rooms. And they came up with a lot of ideas. And that's one thing I wanna, I wanna leave you with is this mindset of experimentation, exploration, right? Creative exploration, not relying on news as it used to be, not relying on the assumption that we do things the way we've always done them because we've done them for hundreds of years. That's not a good enough reason to do the things the way that we've done them. We need to do things in new ways for a new era. And that's what the New York Times has been doing, not always successfully, right? With any kind of creative uh, development, there, there are failures and failures are good because they show that you're pushing the boundaries as long as they come with learning, right? If they come without learning, that's not useful. But if they come with learning and realizations and iterations and developments and changes, that's good. And that's what led to the New York Times to have these five different approaches now among more. There are actually more than that, but, but, but for time's sake, we're focusing on these five. So first of all, cooking, they had a, a reservoir of cooking information, right? That they, that they then used to create a new cooking app. They cr had games, crossword puzzles, all the kinds of other games that people had liked in the New York Times historically. They transformed those into an app. And long story short, 40%, if you look at the trailing three months, 
and the New York Times makes a lot of this data public, so it's not this isn't private data. The New York Times uh, trailing three months, last three months, 40% of the people who put their credit card in or paid in some way for the New York Times were paying for cooking or, or, or games. Now, some people might say, oh, well, that's not journal journalism, that's not quality, that's not important journalism, that's, you know, people are paying for entertainment or whatever. What I would say to you is that if you look at any industry, there's what's called cross-subsidization, cross right? Cross-subsidies. That means every company, no matter what industry it's in, has some products that are super, uh, super popular, right, and profitable, and others that are less so. And, and, and one kind of product subsidizes the production of a different kind of product. When I used to work at Time Magazine, we had uh, bureaus in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I didn't have the opportunity to, to, to report there, but my colleague, close colleagues did. And those, those bureaus were very expensive, very costly. And they were not profit centers. People in, the, in general did not want to read about that, right? That wasn't why uh, many readers were reading the magazine. They read despite that, unfortunately. Um, but the fact is that we felt that that was important coverage and we continued spending and losing money on that. And we made some other money on the entertainment coverage and other parts of the magazine because that was a cross subsidy, right? It allows us to create an overall quality product. Same thing with TV news, same thing with almost anything that happens in journalism. Um, the the e-commerce bit, um, they bought a new company that essentially does independent reviews of technology, right? Um, audio, they started new podcasts, one of which became a tremendous success. And what they did there was also interesting. They innovated not just in the terms of the, the, the way they're doing pricing and the way they're doing distribution and the way they're using technology, but also in the way they're doing content. So rather than just doing a daily summary of all of the news and listing you know, 10 big stories of the day, they pick one story each day and they go in real depth because it turns out people didn't want just another surface view of everything that happened. They wanted to really understand and really hear the voices of the people on one particular interesting issue. So that's the approach they took on a daily basis. And that's been a tremendous success, the most successful podcast in the world, as far as I know. And then in video, they have three different shows across three different networks. So they said, we can create video content, not just uh, digital content, not just uh, text content. And I'll play you a, a little example of, of that. So they, they did one with uh, science, with Netflix, one with uh, the sort of love column, which is a, a fiction series on Amazon, and, and one that covers one weekly story every week with FX and Hulu. Here's a little trailer just to give you a flavor uh, for, for one of these. I'm really going to try to figure out what happened on the ground. A lot of the medallion owners have filed for bankruptcy. Have you thought about doing that? Yeah. I know so many drivers, they kill themselves. Hi, it's Matt Apuzo at the New York Times. What's going on here? What's the real story? Write whatever you want to write about us. I'll go to war every day for our students. A couple of months ago, you and your friends used a car and a butcher's knife to kill four people who had come here as tourists. Can you explain to me why you killed them? I want to start with the biggest picture you can give. So I know, I know some folks may say, well, that's the New York Times. They have millions of dollars to spend. Well, they didn't always have that amount of money, first of all. And uh, if we get to it, I'll show you examples of smaller niche organizations, sometimes with one person that also do creative reporting, right? Maybe not at the scale of the New York Times, obviously not everyone can do that. Um, but the innovation isn't, isn't something that's only the realm of large organizations. Um, one other short, uh, short trailer, this is just in a different realm. It shows that we can think creatively about the kinds of realms that we cover. Um, this is about science and health. Well, what if social part media of could save lives? Right now, there are literally millions of people struggling with undiagnosed medical conditions. I'm Brittany, Kamaya's mom. She's six years old. She's paralyzed anywhere from three to 20 seconds, over 300 times a day. I was in the Gulf War. I served eight years, and now I'm losing my memory. Every time the deja vu happens, I feel my eyes roll in the back of my head, and then I flatline. Sadie has this incurable disease that the only thing you can do is, you know, remove half of her brain. How could that be the only thing you do to, to a kid? 
My body's going through something. The doctors are like, we can't help you. I want to know if somebody else has this. They need something different. The kind of thinking that happens usually outside the hospital. I'm Dr. Lisa Sanders, and I'm a physician at Yale. And for the past 15 years, I've written a column for the New York Times Magazine about patients who have mysterious symptoms. But I always wanted to go the next step. Using the internet, we have the ability to harness all the intelligence of people around the planet to get some answers. I was thrilled to see that many responses. It's what we hope for. You get the idea, and I'll skip. I'll, I'll skip this last one. This is the they turned it into a fictional series related to a column. No one's ever asked you that in an interview before. I don't have to print it. Print what? That story that's written all over your face. Okay, so you get the idea. Um, here's the result. Uh, in in 2020, 587,000 new digital subscriptions. Right, more than all of the 100 uh, other newspapers owned by Gannett, which is the largest U.S. print publisher, um, more than the complete readership of uh, L.A. Times, Boston Globe, where I'm from, the Boston Globe is the big paper. In all of the years uh, since the Boston Globe created a digital presence, they hadn't had that number of subscriptions in just the, that one quarter, just the first three months of 2020. That's uh, from a report in the Financial Times. Um, so, so what I want, want to suggest is that. Um, there's a, there's an opportunity there. So it's not just about negativity. It's not just about failure. There's also an opportunity for really creative new products, new services, and innovation. Um, I want to share a few uh, examples of independence. So uh, you know, the New York Times obviously is a large organization, but I want to suggest that that there are uh, a whole cohort of of independents around the world. There's a flourishing. I would I would call it a renaissance of independent news creators, journalism creators, we can call them solopreneurs, we can call them journalism creators. And their goal is to sustainably serve the information needs of underserved customers. Right? So they're not just creating things that are duplicates of things that are already out there. They're finding gaps and opportunities. They're finding particular geographic areas, demographic groups, and psychographic communities, right? Communities of people with a passion or a personal focus on certain topics, and they're serving those, right? The 19th is serving women. It's by women, for women. It's really for everyone. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, newsroom run by women. Um, and it is uh, already uh, making an impact in the US journalism. Um, they were the first organization to interview Kamala Harris, our, our uh, vice president. Um, the markup is an example of a technology uh, new te technology uh, company news organization challenging the traditional approach to technology reporting, which spotlighted you know the the shiniest new Apple iPhone or the cool new Google device, and they they they're taking technology journalism in a much deeper way. Um, they also create products like this Blacklight. So it's not just about articles. This is a point I want to make: is that we think of news as articles and broadcasts, right? We think of it still in traditional formats. The uh, products and services are also part of what we can do as journalists in serving communities. Um, the information does this in technology, all kinds of organizations. NK News came out of our program focusing strictly on North Korea and creating an independent news source covering North Korea effectively. Um, How India Lives is actually uh, from an alum of ours, John Raja, who created a project to, to focus on making data more accessible across India. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar, might be familiar with that. Uh, narratively is another project that came out of our program, uh, quality storytelling, and their revenue stream also, the revenue streams are, are really a, a good example, I think, of a portfolio strategy. So some of their stories are used by educators instead of boring textbook content. They also have an agency and they sell some of the stories to TV makers and video uh, uh, filmmakers. Um, they have some sponsorship. They created some custom content. So they created, uh, they've created videos, for example, for GE about wind power that GE used and GE paid their agency arm for that, and so on and so on and so forth. They have events um, that they uh, generate revenue from. They do all kinds of, of interesting and creative things. And some of it is, is services, right? Some of it is not directly tied to the content. Some of it is capitalizing on the strengths and skills and knowledge that they have as an organization. There's a tremendous renaissance happening in the realm of newsletters specifically. And this is a really a, a new thing in just the last couple of years. 
all kinds of journalists are, are, are using a variety of platforms, including Substack, writing about all kinds of niche topics. Again, serving a specific geographic area, a demographic niche, or a psychographic community. Um, and I think this is a good example of a, of, a, of a helpful approach, right? It gives the power back to the individual journalists to do with it what they will. Um, it doesn't mean you have an instant win or instant success. It means you have the opportunity to serve a community really creatively. You get your own email list, you get your own website, you get community features, you can do multimedia if you want. Um, you can decide to be free and to let people pay who can pay and let people access for free if they can't pay. Um, and it's completely free to use, right? You only, the only charge you, you incur is a 10% share. If you charge a certain amount of money, um, they take a 10% uh, cut. Um, and, and basically what, what this slide is, is illustrating is we're moving past the intermediary of the news organization, right? And, and in many cases, the individual becomes the mode of, of transmission, right? Directly reaching a reader. And it could be an individual or a small group. A million people are now paying for Substack newsletters, so it's fast growing. Um, people like Emily Atkin, she writes about climate. She now has 2,500 people paying her, um, which adds up to 175,000 US dollars, right? So she doesn't need millions of people. She doesn't need hundreds of thousands of people. She just needs a small but loyal, dedicated group of people who are willing to pay a few dollars a month, right? As much as they pay for a coffee. And she writes about a whole range of different kinds of environmental issues, but she writes with her own personal voice. She's not trying to compete, by the way, with the big news organization. That's often a misperception people have is, well, how can I compete as an individual? Well, what people want isn't that. They don't want a duplicate of a large organization. They want an independent voice, an independent journalist who views things their own way and is authentic and real and a human and speaks with their own human voice and writes in their human voice. And that's the kind of direct authenticity that people are craving. That's why people watch TikTok. That's why people watch YouTube when they could watch TV, right? There's a reason for that. That's why they listen to podcasts instead of listening to radio in some cases. They like the human authenticity, the authenticity of a voice of a person. And they don't always get that from a generic news organization. Um, this is Judd Legum, another one I have a great respect for. He does really quality journalism reporting. He has 138,000 subscribers um, between five and 10% pay. He charges $6 a month or you can opt to pay $50 a year. By the way, if you can't pay, you can access it completely for free. So it's not, it's not a paywall in that sense. And that, that's important because it means democ democratic access to important information. So he keeps 87% of the, the revenue because Substack takes 10% and the credit card processor takes 3%. So that adds up to a six figure salary that's more than enough for him and, and a small team. And, he, and he, can, he can run the organization in a way that uh, hews to his principles and his ideas and no one can stop him. And he can write whatever he wants because he's calling the, the powerful to account, including, by the way, a lot of US public officials. Um, this is an example of one of his reports. So this is not entertainment. This is not light journalism. This is, this is really hardcore reporting um, about who is funding our government and, and so on and so forth. Um, and it's not all superstars, right? Some of them come with an audience, but Nathan did not have an audience. He's a 28-year-old college dropout, but he knew a lot about monetary policy. And he started a, a project about monetary policy and um, ended up with 450 paid subscribers over the first, I don't know exactly what period. And, um, and he ended up being invited to speak at various banks and all kinds of places and made some money that way. And he's on his way to, to having this as a sustainable personal business. Lindsay does the same. She does um, power plays. It's, it's a, um, a, a thing about um, newsletter about uh, sexism in sports. And she notes that um, th there are very, very few female professional sports writers and the perspective of women in sports is often sk uh, skewed out of the conversation and professional women's sports are not given the due that they're, that they're, uh, are not given the coverage that they're due uh, based on the interest of the pop uh, pop populations around the world. So she has a thousand subscribers now. They, she charges them $6 a month, again, which is the price of a coffee or two in the U.S., and uh, seventy-two dollars per seventy-two uh, per year, right? Um, so she's also making a, a, a living at this now, and it's growing, right? It's slowly, slowly growing. Um, my own newsletter, I've seen this, right? I'm not doing it for profit reasons. I'm doing it to learn and to distribute information. Um, but in my own case, I've noticed that um, there's a slow and steady growth 
and there are all kinds of new um, revenue opportunities that arise if I want to uh, avail themselves, avail myself of them. Um, and you can see what I'm doing there. And if you have questions about my newsletter, I'm happy to field them. Um, I've used some sponsored messages, which are clearly labeled, and which are companies that I'm not writing about. Um, and they sponsor a message saying, "Hey, I'm doing this newsletter. I'm doing this podcast. You know, come discover me." Um, and they pay for that, right? That's a sponsored message. So that's the revenue stream, and readers access it for free. And I've also um, drawn other kinds of opportunities and built my network and had other benefits that I wouldn't have had if I were, were not writing that um, a newsletter. So it has a lot of different uh, benefits. And that's one of the reasons why I want to encourage you all to undertake whatever it is that, that is a project that's a passion project for you. Um, I have a lot more to say. We're out basically out of time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of close. I'll say a few words about podcasting, which is also on the dramatic growth right? More than a million podcasts now in the, in the global database, which is used for by all of the podcast apps, they share a database. Um, and all kinds of new platforms emerge to allow people to monetize them. Um, just like with Substack, with Anchor, you can make a free podcast, right? You can make it absolutely free and distributed around the world. So today or tomorrow, you could make your own podcast and start distributing it completely for free, right? Um, and with various platforms, you can add paid membership. Um, there's all kinds of new ways to, to monetize these things. Patreon, um, in the, based in the US, um, Steady, based in Germany. There's all kinds of, and there's, and there's various others. Um, trying to think of one I saw recently. I think it's called Scrollstack in, uh, in India. There's a variety of, of platforms that allow you to monetize these new kinds of independent ventures. Uh, some people are doing it through YouTube. This is an example of a journalist who uses YouTube. And then Patreon, which essentially is patronage. So people pay a monthly fee, a thousand people, actually 1100, more than 1100 people pay a monthly fee to support what Carlos is doing with his independent YouTube videos. Um, and, and as I said, numerous new platforms that enable you to do this. It allows you to protect yourself in an evolving marketplace where the jobs are hard to come by or where the jobs are not, are not uh, always in your control. It allows you to do meaningful work on topics that matter to you. Um, strength and variety of different skills, business skills, distribution skills, technology skills, writing skills, multimedia skills, social media skills, um, and you can have impact on, on people um, and, and get, get emails and get notes and speak to people who say, you know, I really appreciate what you wrote, what you covered, that really meant something to me. Um, so for all these reasons, I, I strongly encourage you to, to, to try and don't expect it to be an overnight success. You just build something slowly and learn as you go. Um, and you focus on three things. What is the product? What, am I, what do I actually have, have to offer? What's, what's a gap that I can fill with a particular product? Um, what does it look like? How long is it? How short is it? What's the tone? What's the focus? What's the value proposition, as we say? Who am I actually serving? So who is this for? What community am I actually serving? And how do I engage with them? How do I learn from them? How do I listen to them? How do I engage with them on an ongoing basis? And then how is it sustainable if you're trying to, to, to uh, generate some, some revenue from it? What are the different kinds of revenue streams that could be part of a broad portfolio. Um, and when you begin, you think about these questions, you know, does anyone actually want this? Like, is this, am I just doing this in a vanity because I, I'm interested in this subject or are there actually people who need this coverage, right? Um, is it feasible? Can I actually do this? I've had a number of people work on projects while they're doing something else, um, including one of our participants from India uh, in, in, the, in the past year. And they managed to do it while they're working at another organization. Um, but they had to add, think hard about that feasibility question. Could they carve out a couple of hours each day or several hours each week at least? Um, is this viable? Like down the road, if I build a little audience, if I have a quality product, is there some revenue I could, I could imagine and what would that look like? Um, and then is it match your values? Is this part of when you wake up in the morning or when you go to bed at night, is this part of who you wanna be? Is this part of something that you want to have as part of your life? That's an important kind of personal question to, to, to consider. Um, and ultimately, you're not trying to reach millions of people, right? You want a thousand people. If you can reach a thousand people and create something for that group of, or it's for, for before a thousand, a hundred, right? Before a hundred, ten, right? You build up from the ground up, ten, then a hundred, right? And then you get to a thousand. And once you reach a thousand, you're really doing something of impact, right? We have this misperception that we need to reach hundreds of thousands of people or have huge traffic, right? And I would argue in this era, it's not about volume. It's about the quality of connection and the quality of impact in a small dedicated group of people. And it's a very different a very different shift in thinking, right? It's a shift in thinking away from scale and toward quality. 
Um, and and there are lots of things to, to think about. These are these will be my last few thoughts, and then we'll and then we'll jump to questions. Um, uh, there, there are three basic ways to think about what to what to how to start what to start. Right. Think about capability, community, or catalyst. Capability means what are my skills. Right? Can I can I translate stuff from Chinese and therefore I can create a, a site about what's going on in China? Right? Do I have knowledge of the history of Indian politics? Right? Or I have to, do I have knowledge of currency markets and cryptocurrency? Right? Do I have a passion around the history of jazz? Right? And I can reach the people who are passionate about jazz. Or do I or do I have a personal interest in what is like living with leukemia? Right? Because I have a family member who who has leukemia, and I have a passion around making a difference for for the hundreds of thousands of people who live with that that condition. Right? These are ways you think about your own capabilities. You look inward to determine what you're actually going to do. You can also look at your network. Do you have contacts who have powerful reach in the audio realm? Or do you have a network of people who really have knowledge and expertise around something that you can help partner with on something? Right? So you can look internally at your capabilities. You can look externally at a community, at the real problems that people are facing or the real needs that people have. The third way to determine an idea for you to start your venture or to collaborate with others on a venture is to look at an external catalyst. So is there some new technology, some new solution, some new platform that can give you an, an entry point into something? Do you have inspiration from some particular event, right? There are people launching things this week and last week about what's going on in Russia and Ukraine, right? There are people launching things all the time about new technologies, about new things that are happening, positive and negative in the world, right? That are taking inspiration from real world events. Um, so those are all ways to find ideas, to think about things that you can create. Um, and you can start with, as I said, your strengths. What can you do? What are your skills, right? Um, I like to think of this as your hands, your head, your heart, right? And your whole body, your whole network, right? So your, your hands are what you can do, um, what the specific skills that you have that are distinct, um, what you know is your knowledge, your, your expertise, your passion, and then your network. Um, and what communities are you part of? your professional communities, your demographic communities, your passion communities, and your geographic communities. And those are all, uh, I think, places to begin this journey or to continue the journey if you're already on it. Um, so develop your own develop your own project. That's my, my final call to action. And let me let me stop there and uh, and open up for um, for for questions final questions. And, and I appreciate, I want to say, I appreciate the fact that you've all stuck with me through this session and that you're taking the time to, to be here today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you and, and an honor to have a chance to, to talk with you. And and uh, let's take some, some final questions here uh, before wrapping up. And you can feel free again to use the, I'll, I'll switch over to the Q&A tab um, momentarily. I, I see someone has raised hands. Um, let's start with uh, Malavika. Sorry if I'm, if I'm mispronouncing people's names. Yeah. I apologize in advance. Malavika and then Sujoy and then Muskan. Again, I, I apologize for mispronouncing your names. And if anyone else wants to add a question uh, in the chat or in the Q&A um, through Slido, feel free to do that. Uh, Malavika, Hi. please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so this is with regard to the Reuters report that you had shown in one of the slides, the 2019 yes. report. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that uh, you didn't find the percentage of people that uh, were willing to pay for news online. You mentioned that with respect to India, you didn't find the data reliable or you thought it was sketchy. So I wanted to know what was the data and why did you think so? And secondly, um, what was the result of, was, was there like a survey conducted by Reuters in Africa or in the, the Middle East? And I was like curious to know, like what was the result of that? Yeah. So there's not there's not good reliable data in Africa, first of all, um, and you'll see that on the on the the diagrams in the Reuters Digital News Report, by the way, which I commend to all of you. Um, they actually have a report specifically about India, um, which I which I which I would recommend reading. It's from 2019, and I'll put put the link in here um, in the chat in case you're interested. In case people haven't seen that or heard of it, um, I'll put that in the chat. Um, uh, but it does not really delve too much into the the um, financial side of things. It's more about trust and news and so forth. Um, and 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 the regular digital news report um, for Reuters, um, which is just digitalnewsreport.org, and I'll put that link in as well. That's also an excellent source of information, kind of about what's happening in various different countries. It's really one of the the, the stronger 
kind of international reports about the state of, of digital news around the world. Um, but but I, I've seen a couple of different independent sort of reports about, about India, but the data that, have, that, that they quote is, it's not clear how they're deriving that or how, what the survey sample size is. It just, it just felt very, very um, sketchy to me. It didn't feel like it was as robust as the, as the data for other countries in the Reuters report. And I don't know all of the rationale behind that. I haven't, haven't looked at all the methodology. Um, but uh, you know, I would I would welcome any input from anyone here. If you do come upon that, or if you feel like there is a good data source, I would love to know that because I would love to see a more reliable a data source. I, I think it has to do with partly just the reach of the organizations that are doing that research um, and the the survey methodology that just is is challenging in in large areas of of Africa. It's also challenging in in parts of China and in, and in India. I think it also has proven challenging. Um, uh, so yeah, sorry, I'm not sure if that's particularly helpful in answering your question, but it's it's a the data is is challenging. Uh, I'm sorry uh, about the Middle East. Was there something on the Middle East? No, not not much data. There's a little bit. There's a little bit of data on on um, a couple of the countries in the Middle East. And if you look at the digitalnewsreport.org, you'll see that the, you can actually select drop down menu, select by country. So I'd encourage you to sort of check that out, and they okay. give a pretty detailed view of some countries, but many others are not included. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for being here. Sujoy. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the lecture. Uh, my question is, sir, like oh, when we are uh, working on a prototype or when we have designed a product, how do we uh, uh, find out our target audience first? And uh, is there any particular way to look at it? Uh, is our con uh, like our content decides our audience or just or our region decides our audience or our way of telling the story decides our audience? Or, uh, and the second thing is, uh, to, uh, is it uh, okay to start our organization um, on the very first day on a, uh, on a, on a fixed business model? Or uh, like, how do you support this thing? Like, or new, especially news organization changing their business model midway or after some time? Uh, like, that's my two questions. Yeah, so let me see if I'm understanding correctly. First, you're asking about kind of how, how you decide who the audience is really. And, and the second is, uh, is do you change the model along the way or do you kind of, how, when, do you, when do you settle on the, the business model? Is that, is that? Yeah, how do we stick with just one business model? Yeah, so, so I, I think big picture, the mindset I would encourage um, is an experimental scientific mindset, right? So many of you I'm sure have studied science and you start with a hypothesis, right? I think, that there's a gap in the marketplace for people who have this particular health condition, right? Or people who live in this particular area, right? Or for women in this particular industry, right? Or for people who are emerging from school and trying to follow this profession, right? There's all kinds of um, situations, right? Life situations that people find themselves in. And, and one thing I want to emphasize is, you know, uh, traditionally, a lot of people think, well, I'm aiming at this particular age group. I'm aiming at, you know, men between 18 and 34 something. I, I think that's actually a, a misplaced focus. I think focus on life stages. Right. So people who are becoming fathers for the first time and have children under two years old. Right. Somebody started fatherly. Somebody I know started fatherly because there were so many sites for women. Right. Moms. But there were very few sites for men at the time, men becoming parents. So that's not an age group. Right. You could be 18. You could be 25. You could be 40. Right. It's instead a life stage. So I would think in terms of life stages and communities that have particular needs based on the life stage they're going through or experiences that they have in life that they have in common which is a stronger motivation to consume content or be part of a community than just your raw age, right? Being 30 or being male or female doesn't necessarily mean you have a particular interest or a particular passion around something, right? The life stage is much more relevant. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is the hypothesis thing. So, so you start with a hypothesis. So I think there's an opportunity to reach men who are new dads because many of them are really interested in fathering. I'm just giving an example, but they're not adequately served in the marketplace. So to test that hypothesis, Right, you run initial experiments. Right, an initial product is an experiment. Right, to see whether that resonates, and then you have to be careful because sometimes it might not resonate because it's not done well, or because you're not reaching the right people. Um, but uh, but once you test a variety of factors, you can see okay, this is resonating. Right, people are responding to this. People are excited about this. People are signing up for this. People are expressing interest. They want to contribute. They want to hear more. They have questions. They're responding. They're opening up an email. Some of the metrics are simple, right? It's just open rates or just response rates, um, listen rates, download rates, those kinds of things. Um, some of the metrics are qualitative. So it's not just about quantitative. 
if you reach somebody and somebody responds and they say, you know, this was really impactful for me. I really want more. Do you have more? Can I read more? You know, where can I find more information? That's a qualitative signal. So you look at signals and you evolve your, your, you develop your hypothesis. So maybe you were right about fathers needing more content, but maybe you were wrong about the fact that they wanted hour long, you know, live events. Maybe what they actually want is quick takes, quick, quick, short newsletters on different topics or something else. Right. So that's the, the mindset is the, is the, kind of scientific mindset driven by hypotheses that evolve and iterate over time. Um, and focusing in terms of the community on groups of people that are governed not by their pure demographics only, but also by their, their life stage. And in terms of which comes first, I think there are either ways, different ways to do it. You can focus on your capabilities and your expertise and knowledge first, and then see if there's community that matches that, or you can start with a community. And you say, I know people in this community, I'm part of this community, or I care about this community. And then how can I find which part of my skills, what can I bring to match that community. And ultimately is you want that match of your strengths, your skills, your knowledge, your expertise, your network, things that you can do well, that you can add and meet the needs of a particular community, whether it's a, a life stage community or some other. Um, Muskan. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for today, sir. So my question to you is, um, so uh, you showed us a lot of challenges which uh, one faced during the startup and uh, the ways we can figure it out by showing some examples of bringing some new things like a video of uh, bringing the, the like New York Times did of bringing the doctor to the uh, website and uh, helping it out. But sir, in India, one thing which uh, we lack behind is the use of technology, like use of internet. We are not that much like only 25 to 30 percent of uh, people around use internet and uh, and can reach to technology in some or the other way so i would like to ask if if you were here and wanted to do a startup what would have been your strategy because if you want to uh, you want to reach those people and if they have some serious issue and you want to show them you want them to reach for their uh, interest how would you have done it here? Like how, uh, so give us some strategy or some ideas to do a startup in India where technology, uh, a, a big barrier is there between technology and the internet and everything. Yeah, so so I think each market has its own challenges, right? And you know far more about your market than I do. So I wouldn't presume to tell you how to reach people in your market. I can give you some thoughts and some, some uh, observations about what's happened around the world. One is, you know, there are parts of, 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 of Africa, for example, where they have a central um, bulletin board, essentially, right? News is on a, a blackboard, right? And it's distributed through people coming through the central town square and, and accessing the news in physical form, right? There are other places where news is distributed through what we call zines, right? Which is basically mimeographed or photographed paper distributed to physical locations, right? And then distributed onward. Um, there's a, an organization in India, and I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting the name, unfortunately, which I regret, um, but they essentially have a network um, where they distribute information by phone. So people call in and they actually generate their own news reports. And then there's an editor at the central point, right, who then does some editing of those and then distributes a, a news report um, also by phone that people can access. So people call in to share their own news, right? An editor is an intermediary kind of edits some of that and then distributes it back to the people and to other people also by phone. So phone networks um, are, are, are at the core of what's done in that particular organization in India. And, and I apologize again, if, if um, someone follows up with me, I will, I will uh, track Net down. Uh, Jeremy, CG Net Swara. Yes, thank you. Swara. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and maybe you can put a link um, so people can, can see uh, more information. Thank you, yes, that's exactly it. And they've been here in New York and we've spoken and, and um, I've listened and learned from them and we've had a nice dialogue. And I think that's a good example, um, in, in particularly in remote areas. Again, you can tell me, you know far better your market, so you can tell me if, that's a, if that seems like a good model to you. But I know they've had some, some really nice successes and some examples of cases where, for example, the local water access was problematic and they were able to, through their reporting, uh, lead to some uh, improvements in that, in that local um, system. So, so that's, one, that's one model. I, I, I think also, um, you know, there are going to be continually emerging approaches where you have new social platforms, where you have uh, one, one other uh, approach that's been taken um, by here, someone here in New York, they, they, they want to serve um, low income communities around New York City. And, you know, New York City has a lot of technology, but, you know, there are a lot of people who just aren't accessing it or don't know where to find it. So they actually use all the bus stops. They created essentially news signs and put them at all the different bus stops in a particular part of the city. And there, there were QR codes. So those who had a phone, you know, could get more information, but they could also just access people who were coming, you know, highly trafficked areas 
and they would replace that on a regular basis. So people could kind of get used to updated news signs using the posters for news distribution, right? And then if you think about an economic model behind that, you know, if they're reaching a lot of people and people are looking at those signs, if I'm an advertiser, I'd rather be associated with that sign than have a sign somewhere else that no one's looking, right? So you can imagine they could include some sort of a marketing or sponsorship um, either on their web page, you know, access through the QR code or just, you know, at the bottom of the sign somewhere or something. Um, so I think there are, there are a lot of creative approaches. I think it always starts with the people, right? It always starts with interviewing people one by one, talking to people, listening to people, observing their daily behavior, right? What are they doing? What do they do when they wake up? Where do they look for news? Who do they talk to? Where does the community gather? What are the key challenges the community is facing? What are the questions that they're asking? Where are they looking for information? How are they already finding information? And if you think about big, well, one way you can tell this works, or this is a good strategy, if you look at the big multinational companies, including those that have come into India and done some of, some of which have done well, look at what they do. Look at how they do their market research. They do exactly this. They observe the behavior. They go and watch someone cleaning in their own home, right? They go and watch someone going to work and how are they accessing information? How are they cleaning their, their themselves? How are they you know, preparing themselves for the workday and all that stuff. And then only then do they come with a product and they say, we're not gonna change your life. We're gonna fit into your life because this is your daily habits. We have an opportunity to fit into your daily habits in this kind of way. We know you already pay for this other product. We're gonna give you a slightly different product, even cheaper, that's a little bit better, something like that. So that, that's a little bit of uh, the way, way I would think about it. Um, on a side note, a couple of people have messaged me privately about the data from India question. And there is some data in the Reuters Digital News Report, as someone pointed out, um, that says that 36% of people were willing to pay, but uh, the data was limited and it skewed to a particular urban young educated population and it only included uh, a small sample size. So, so that's again, like an example of one of the limitations of the data. Um, and it also, you know, there's a question about how much people are spending, right? So if people are spending a few cents or something, is that the same as, you know, in another country where they might be spending uh, a substantially more amount of money? So that's, that's part of the challenges of the, of the data. But thank you for those of you who shared that, that data point in the, in the 2021 Reuters news report. Dev, did you want to add something uh, before we take maybe one one or so final question? No, I would rather leave them to the uh, to leave to the guest. So anybody else? Okay. I see Sneha has a question, I think, or hand up if you wanted to add something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm um, sorry, I won't be able to switch on my camera, my network. Sure, that's is, fine. Uh, yeah. okay, no problem. So, um, my question is very basic. Um, so I have a newsletter on Substack. Um, I do it as a hobby at the moment, but I just I just want to know out of curiosity. I mean, how do we really gain traction on this? And if I want to convert this into you know a, a full fledged media organization or or a money making profitable venture, how do I pitch this to investors? That's my question. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I wouldn't look to investors. Um, I wouldn't look to investors first and foremost. I, I, I think investors in general are looking for um, large organizations and, and capitalized companies and companies that are gonna scale to reach millions of people. So I wouldn't in general first look to investors. I would basically focus on what we call bootstrapping, right? Which is like using your sweat, your equity, you're building your own equity, right? You wanna have ownership of your own thing and you wanna build it in a way that makes sense to you at a scale that, and a pace and a, and a, and a cadence that, that is optimal for you. Um, so what I would look for is how can you gradually build the audience, build the community of people who are using this and, and, and finding it useful? And then how can you find partners who can help you reach new audiences that you haven't yet reached? In the case of newsletters, the number one best way to grow a newsletter, the best way to grow a newsletter is through other newsletters. So I've done this myself and I've seen many other newsletters and students and, and colleagues and others do it. Newsletters are where people are already newsletter readers. So if they see a newsletter and they say, hey, Sneha's got this great newsletter as well. Here's what she covers. Sign up. And that, that tends to work quite, quite well um, because people are already in that mindset. They're already in their email. So that's the number one thing I would do. I would find 10 other people, and it could be people in, in India. They could be people anywhere in the world who share some kind of interest. DM them on Twitter. Email them, right? Follow, follow them. So, you know, and, and not just in a transactional way. You can say, I really like what you're doing. Um, here's, you know, I'd love to contribute to your thing, right? And then it becomes a, 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 a mutually beneficial kind of thing. I'll give you an example of somebody that I reached out to. Um, this guy runs this newsletter called Holri in, in India, actually. And he um, has a nice newsletter. It's along the lines of my Wonder Tools in some way, 
And we got in touch with one another. Oops, I think I, did I send it? Sorry, I sent that as an individual message. I meant to send it to uh, the full chat. So let me resend that. Um, and uh, we got in touch with one another. I can't remember now if he reached out to me first or I reached out to him, I can't remember. But I liked his newsletter, he liked mine. And we ended up both mentioning each other in our each other's newsletter. And we both gained some readers from that. Um, so, so that's a very common and very, uh, I think, successful tactic. And, and, uh, and if you have further questions about your own newsletter and you wanna ping me with a specific question, I'm happy to, uh, to try to be of help. Um, maybe okay. one final one, and then I have to run. If someone has a final one, and then I have a, a meeting that I'm going to run off to. And, and I'd love to, I'd love your input. Um, here's my newsletter again, and I'd love anyone's input. If you have suggestions, if you have input, if you have things I should be writing about or things I should do differently, um, I'd love your input. Um, I'm always interested in feedback from people um, on the newsletter. So feel free to, to share that. And, and Darshan, uh, maybe you'll be the last last question. Yes, sir. First of all, thank you very much for the insightful session, sir. So my question to you is, since, uh, you know, like starting something is about solving a problem. So like, if you know the problem exists and you think this, the idea that you are going to create is going to solve the problem of the larger community, let's uh, imagine of uh, people from Asia. So for that, of course, you need a lot of investment. Uh, so in that case, uh, in this scenario, what do you think uh, the, uh, you know, angel investors who really want uh, journalism to be independent are, are looking for? Yeah, again, I would challenge the assumption you need a lot of money. I, I think, you know, a newsletter you start for free, a podcast you start for free, you put in your sweat, your equity, That that's, that's, that's what you're doing is you're putting in your effort and that's time. Your time is the valuable thing you're investing in your effort and your network and your passion. Those are the things, those are the things you're investing. Money is not so much the crucial component. You're not creating, you know, a factory to produce, you know, pharmaceuticals. You know, you don't have, you know, raw materials that you have to spend a lot of money on. So it's not so much people get distracted by needing a lot of money or, or wanting fancy equipment. It's not about that. You can use your phone. Your brain is what matters. Your effort, your heart is what matters. Your passion is what matters. That's what you should invest in. Don't worry about angel investors. Just create a product that's really great. Create a newsletter, a podcast, a website that has really good content, right? And then, and then at some point, you find someone who's interested because it's a good product, because you've demonstrated that there's a, a, an audience that really likes this. That's what they want. So if you could go back to the investors, if at some point down the road, you want to get investors, you want to get someone to support you. By the way, I would look first to family and friends, right? Not to investors. Investors can be, have all kinds of motivations, right? If you want someone you can trust and someone you know, and a family and friend uh, is, is a better starting point. And, and you want them to invest because you've already demonstrated what you're going to do. You don't want them to invest in a pipe dream or a, a hope and a prayer. You want them to invest in something because you've already demonstrated there are 500 people getting this or 1,000 or 5,000 people already receiving this or already reading this. You've gotten this validation. You've been written about by this person or you've been validated in some ways, right? Because you want objective validation that shows the value you're creating. You don't want it to be about you convincing them that you're going to maybe do something in the future, right? Because you might mislead them that way and you don't want to be responsible for that either. So that would be my, 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 um, my point on that. And with that, I will bid you adieu. Thank you all for, for being here and for sticking with this, this session and for, for doing the work that you do. There are a lot of fields you could all be in that are a lot more probably lucrative or, or, or establish, uh, you know, allow you to establish fame and prestige in, in different ways. And, and I salute you for being interested in journalism and motivated to, 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 um, to be part of a conversation like this one and to do the work that you're, you're doing and to learn what you're learning. And, and I encourage you to, to, to continue fighting the fight and doing the work that you're doing and, and creating something new. Again, back to my original call to, to action, do, 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 do the best you can to come up with something new. And if you, if you uh, create something or if you already are creating something as some of you are, um, you can ping me. I'll put my email in here again. Um, and uh, and um, you can ping me and say, hey, here's my thing. And if you have a specific question, um, you can ask a specific question. If I can share a thought, I'll try to share a thought. And if you've been put on my newsletter, I always welcome that as well. So thanks and have a great thank rest you. of your, your evening and, and, and great rest of your week. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. It's always it's been an honor to have you here and it's been very informative. And uh, it would be great if you could uh, share your slide deck with me. So that Absolutely. I can share. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you, sir.